Uh, well, we're top of the hour, so I'm just going to do a very brief overview here of a few things. I'm going to pass it over to Justin to, to kick off the session and moderate the rest of it. Um, I just want to, first of all, say thanks for all of you that are here uh, attending the session and those of you that will be joining in and uh, viewing the recording later on. For some of you, this may be the first time you've attended one of the uh, Learning Analytics Learning Network events. Uh, this is a uh, came out of a project that uh, Justin and Ryan Baker uh, and I were involved with, which was an NSF grant that did not get funded, but we decided the idea of people networking and building literacy and capabilities around learning analytics was significant enough that we should do it regardless. Uh, after chatting with a colleague out of Australia, Shane Dawson, uh, we've had uh, Florence Gabriel join us, who I don't believe will be on the call because it's early morning for her. But uh, so we decided that we would proceed and create this community for individuals who want to stay up to top, uh, up to speed on sort of the latest and the greatest activities in learning analytics. Some of these events are level so you'll find sort of a gentle introduction to the domain areas some of them are more involved and are more complex ideally we want to create a space where people can meet asynchronously so we have a canvas site set up uh, at UTA where people can join in and we have this obviously environment and regular events uh, happening here we have a workshop happening at the Learning Analytics Conference in Germany in a few weeks, and the list goes on. So basically, this is a community for individuals who are interested in what's happening in learning analytics and what they can do to stay up to top on some of the latest trends. Uh, right now, we've had Justice, uh, we've got uh, Justin and Florence that are the primary leads on this project. So I've dropped the link into the main site, which will give you some information on what it's about, upcoming events, recordings from previous events. You can have a look at those when you have an opportunity. But without anything further, I just want to say thanks to, to Justin and Florence, of course, for leading this, and particularly today for, for Pete, uh, Henry, and Elizabeth for uh, giving us uh, their insights into this topic. Justin, to you. All right. So, um, as George mentioned, we have a, um, something in the UTA uh, catalog, which is open for anybody inside and outside to be a part of. And we're gonna host um, all of our resources in this, uh, in this Canvas shell. So if you go to, um, it's the UTA catalog at instructure.com, um, you can go and enroll in the course. Um, we are still working on one little bug in <laughs> this. Um, if you're external to UTA, you can enroll in it, but as you see, and you'll see in like the top right corner, it'll say log in. And unfortunately, we're still trying to work through an issue where it only is trying to get through employees, but that should be worth, uh, we should have work on for that really, really soon. And then in the actual um, shell itself, um, we uh, invite you if you do just choose to enroll and be a part of this. Um, we do have things like, um, like a survey like to get to know um, who's wanting to be a part of it. Um, we are um, also looking to create a, um, a network of, in, in the larger network in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, so we'd like to be able to see what people need and what kind of events that we can do future, in the future here at UTA. Um, and then um, if you could think of other people that might be involved, definitely please share the word. We would um, love to be able to get a lot more people here, both in the K-12 and higher ed space and potentially even industry, yes. For the record, are y'all, is College of Science doing the new master's degree? Or can you speak on that, or is that not part of this? It's not necessarily part of this right oh, okay. now, but yes, we are looking to have a new master's of science and learning in politics. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just, you know, invite you to be part of this. And then we have um, resources here. So if you ever need to come back and access any of these um, after the event, or if you know somebody that would like to join up, um, and you look at these things um, asynchronously, um, we'll have them all um, here, we'll have everything here for every event uh, going forward. So obviously for today, we have these including our different activities, as well as even a facilitator's guide. So if you would like to even run something on your own somewhere, we'll have those kind of resources for you so that then you can go and practice through the, the different activities. Today's a very introductory ses that, that session. Um, some of these will be a little bit more advanced topics though in the future. Um, as George mentioned, um, we do have um, some events coming up. Um, we're working with uh, Georgetown uh, University right now. They're doing an unconference session that's going to be geared towards graduate students and some of the issues they're um, having with uh, learning analytics. And then, as George mentioned, we also have the LAP workshop that's coming up. It'll be in Frankfurt. 
Um, I'm working with Ryan Baker, Baker again, if you were here, <laughs> he mentioned which Ryan was online, uh, Ryan Baker uh, from University of Pennsylvania. They'll be doing one, and we're looking to also do another session here uh, at the beginning of August. So without further ado, I don't want to take too much more time on this. Let's get to the actual really good stuff here. So I'll introduce, uh, we have uh, Dr. Pete Smith, and we have Henry Anderson, and when Elizabeth Powers, who uh, is online, um, and they've put together a great uh, uh, talk for us, and then we're also going to work through an activity together when we're done. And they have uh, created some really great resources for you on the topics of natural language understandings. Thank you all. Yeah, so, and Elizabeth is joining us online, so thank you, Elizabeth, as well. Um, we mentioned it's going to be an introductory session. We tried to make this a very gentle introductory session uh, to NLP. And so we're going to share some slides uh, for about uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes or so. And then we'll do a short handout where you get to touch some language data and think about its value and think about how you might use it in your research settings. And as, as Justin said, and as I just said as well, we're really going to start from the very beginning. Uh, so if you are more experienced with some of the tools we talk about, natural language processing as we move, uh, toward perhaps smarter tools in the future, more AI-infused tools in the future. Uh, you may find this more of a, a rehash of some of the basic concepts, and we encourage questions at all levels, but our, our, our target today is really to begin thinking about natural language, what it can bring to you as researchers in the fields of education or education-related fields, show you some tools that are currently in use in the field uh, that help you process and think about insights from natural language, and in particular, show you some future directions where the field is going. We're going to share some materials on some work that Henry's doing in vector space and some of those lay out there ideas that are just you know, probably more prevalent in the AI world uh, than the educational research world today. So hopefully we'll get all of that done in, I say, 25 minutes, and I do talk quickly, um, but we'll, we'll see how much we can cover. And then hold on to your handouts. We'll touch some of the language data here in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to need to get slides up and full screen, and I'm going to let the, the technical gurus do that. There's our slides. Get control L. Control L. So our basic talk today uh, is really going to revolve around these two concepts. This notion of natural language processing, which we tend to abbreviate as NLP, and a second related concept, natural language understanding, which as you'll see, um, we see as more future oriented as NLP systems tend to get smarter and bring uh, more coherent modeled knowledge with them. Uh, we think that's a very different piece and then that we're growing into, I think a new generation of tools to come and a new generation of analyses to come uh, that really are smarter, more AI infused and a little bit different than some of the tools that uh, that we are working with today. So we're going to give you some examples, we're going to give you some definitions. That's the, the gentle introduction part. I'll let you think about where natural language processing is happening in your lives today, and I guarantee it's happening. It's happening on your phones, it's happening on your desktops, it's happening when you call call centers. Uh, those are all good examples of NLP in process. And we're also going to share some of the debates that are happening in the AI world broadly. If you've been following Jan LeCun or Jeff Hinton or Gary Marcus and some of the really contentious debates that are out there about the future of AI, uh, we're part of that. In fact, a lot of what they're arguing with and about is language and the ability of computers to understand language in ways that are more than just counting of words, you know, that are really thinking about meaning and understanding as a goal moving forward in some of the work we do. If you have studied any of the, the hype around big data, uh, you know that obviously we're, we're literally drowning in data. But one of the factors that's not oftentimes noted is that the vast majority of the growth in the, in the world around us is what we would call unstructured data. And I'm going to give you some examples here. One, uh, natural language is one example of unstructured data, as are images, as are video, as are a wide variety of other types of digital materials that don't look like structured data. And I like to think of these as the doctor's notes of data. Uh, when you go to the doctor's office and the doctor sits in front of his or her laptop, there are certain preformed boxes, certain preformed data elements that he or she may gather from you or use uh, in the visit with you, right? Your name, your date of birth, your date of admittance, have you had your flu shot, those sorts of things, and on the date of your flu shot. But in that record is also 
a really nice example of unstructured data, the notes that that physician takes about you um, that contain a whole set of insights and, and information that may or may not be readily available or readily apparent from the structured part of the record, right? It's a little hard to see here, but you, know, you get notes such as patient came in complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, lingering headaches, smokes two packs a day, family history of heart disease, has been experiencing these systems for, or these symptoms for 12 hours. And you can begin to get a, a hint, certainly, that there's a lot of valuable information here uh, that doesn't look like the structured side of the equation. And ideally, uh, as they are treating you, as other physicians see your record or work with your record, or when you visit that doctor six months down the road, you're hoping that all of the insight that's available in the unstructured data uh, is available to that doctor or to the folks who, who might treat you. And, and we're going to come at the words today. We're not really going to be thinking too much about images or video or audio or any of the other formats. We're really thinking about words where students might speak, where educators might speak, where you might find language data in your settings. And what, what do we do with that? How do we look at that data? How do we process that data? How do we find insight? Just intuitively, you're thinking, boy, there's some really key facts here. As I'm treating this patient, there's a lot of information here that may not necessarily be in the checklist of questions uh, that generated the more structured data. And in general, the premise that we all work under in the, the natural language processing world is that when words are used, when they're either recorded, this happens to be a physician, but in an educational setting, it might be some students writing or working, might be a student keeping a journal in a service learning course. It might be students writing or learners writing in a discussion board in an online course. Uh, it might be transcript of a classroom session or a transcript of a tutoring session. Wherever words are used and are recorded and can be analyzed, uh, our premise is those words give us insight that we cannot gain from traditional measures. Uh, you might have, for example, a student writing in a discussion board expressing some content information, maybe saying, boy, I'm struggling in this course because I'm not understanding some of these concepts. You know, we're getting some insight into their thinking uh, into their affect, how they might be feeling about a particular element. And that's the premise that underlies natural language processing, natural language understanding. All of us who work in, you know, what you may have also heard previously as qualitative research, wherever that more language-based, uh, unstructured data comes from. Uh, Stretchco, um, who's part of our network and has been part of uh, uh, all of our networks for some years, put together this beautiful slide, giving you, and, and all of this is available for download in, uh, in the online course, uh, where else might you find language data in your daily work as educators, right? I mentioned discussion boards and online courses. I mentioned journals for service learners. Where else in, in your work here at UTA are you seeing language data from students as part of courses or work or other things that you're doing? Who'd like to throw out a couple of examples? Teams back channel chat. Chat, teams back channel, discussions between say teacher and student or student and student, good language. Feedback. Student feedback surveys have a lot of language in them and in fact the new tool we have on campus actually does some thematic analysis if you've taught a course and students have written their comments and you've reviewed those comments one of the things they give you is some pretty basic word clouds and other sort of uh, thematic uh, things here's the words that many of your students are saying about you as a teacher uh, here are the themes that many of the students are thinking about where else might you see language data Reflections. Reflections, right? Uh, reflective writing is a huge way to ask students to put words on paper, put them into assignments, reflect on topics. We know it has great value as depth of thinking and critical thinking. Uh, that language is also potentially quite valuable to us, uh, once again, as sort of an insight to what those students are thinking and, and how they're approaching what they're doing. And uh, we opened up with George's voice here uh, coming out of the ceiling. Uh, this was the slide that George uses in uh, the initial course in the learning analytics sequence to say, you know, where do we find the opportunity to think about learning analytics in a variety of settings as educators, whether it's part of the teaching act, uh, evaluation and feedback, the content, 
that many of our students consume uh, is linguistic data. Um, the syllabuses that we pass out are linguistic data. The language students write about in their LinkedIn profiles after they graduate, those are language data. And so as you begin to think, there are a wide variety of places you can reach in, see data about, from, or describing students or teachers or learners. Any of you ever uh, do a survey with your students in general or are part of a survey process? Oftentimes you ask both structured answer questions as well as questions that allow unstructured responses. And so as you think about what do I do with all those words, um, these are places where all of us begin to think about um, how language data fits into learning analytics. This quote uh, from a, a scholar in our learning analytics community, I think really begins to put some of this in perspective. Uh, one of the quick and dirty ways, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a full definition of the power of unstructured data, is that frequently it gives us context. We have an immense amount of information in our structured data systems, but the minute a learner or a teacher or a survey respondent, someone writing a reflection or someone writing a review of teaching begins to put words on a page, you start to see the stories and the narratives. You start to see the words of the student providing context. And so in many ways, I'll keep coming back to that word context, although it's very easy to think about those words as data and what tools we can point at that data to get some analysis. Most frequently, they give us and we're, we're buried in quantitative data as well. Oftentimes, though, we will think about these quantitative sources as providing not only insight via processing of those words, but really something that you know, gives us the context for all of our numerical data. We're doing all sorts of things automatically, algorithmically. Um, many of you on your phones, for example, uh, have ASR, some form of speech recognition. Uh, you may have it in Siri, you may have it in a variety of apps, uh, you may use it to text when you're driving and you shouldn't be texting and you just simply want to speak some words in, have them transcribed and sent to, uh, sent to somebody. Um, and as you begin to look at all of the tasks that are possible, um, you're seeing the results of natural language processing nearly every day. Every time you open up your screen and go to Outlook, uh, the email that's flowing into your account is being categorized. Text categorization is a task that's frequently uh, cited under natural language processing. What is Outlook categorizing? It's looking for junk looking for spam, uh, it's making some decisions for you automatically. In some cases, you can shape those decisions, uh, but in other cases, their language models are looking at the millions and millions of incoming emails to our campus every day and making some decisions. Uh, are they spam? Do they contain links that may be of some danger to the readers, et cetera? So these are a wide variety of things that we're doing already uh, algorithmically, and I'll, I'll show you a list here in just a second, please. Uh so my question is to process all the information you are giving is when you say natural language processing yeah i think i have in my mind but i want to hear it from you what is unnatural i'm i <laughs> the linguist over here will jump in i'll yeah. let i'll let him uh, confuse yeah i'm sorry answer that ah, that's fine so this is kind of an unfortunate terminological thing where there isn't really unnatural language. In this case, natural language is the same way that linguists tend to use it, just meaning human language. So natural language is what we're doing right now. I'm having a conversation, Pete's lecturing, you're asking questions. But if we were gonna say, uh, what would be an example of unnatural language? I, I, what I was generalist. thinking maybe, and so I was thinking why we're calling it natural language. I was thinking when I give the questions to my students, right? The scientific questions. Right. And then they answer it in a scientific terms. So that's it. That's not natural because they have been taught to give answers short in those scientific terms. So I was thinking maybe that's that's more learned rather than natural. It's more so. like standard language. Yes, so that's what I was thinking, but I wanted to make sure if my thinking is in the right direction. So that would still absolutely fall at, under an example of natural language. Okay. It would just be, the term we would use is it's very domain specific. Okay. So it's still natural language. It's still using, you know, English, presumably in this case, um, or whatever other natural language the courses are being conducted in. 
but it's just the language of, in this case, uh, which, which specific field of science? Let's say physics or okay, astronomy. Physics. Yeah, right. So yeah, using the language of physics, which is going to be a little bit different from, say, the language of chemistry or the language of computer science or the language of learning analytics, natural language processing. So it's still natural language. It's just, we can kind of put scare quotes around the word dialect, but we're still going to call it natural because it's still being generated by a human being using sort of standard grammatical, lexical, morphological structures. So there is nothing unnatural? No, there's nothing unnatural. So this natural word is even needed? This is, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Why, 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 I, I bet we'll circle back to that. But the point you've hit is a really good one. All, is all writing created equal? Is all language created equal? Is a student's journal about service learning where he or she is encountering societal issues, thinking deeply about uh, the community around him or her, going to perhaps yield for us the same insights that you posing word problems to your students who respond in very specific, very academic, formal language uh, is used as the standard there. Uh, one of the things we're struggling with here at UTA, we're gonna talk about a study at the end where we're taking some academic writing by students and trying to derive some insight from that writing. And we're finding it really hard to pull, if you will, the personality of students mm -hmm. out of writing that looks very standard and very academic um, and we fully suspect that a reflection or a service learning journal or an interview say where somebody is asking questions about someone's learning history or their time at UTA may bring us a little bit more insight into into some of what the students are uh, talking about experiencing learning um, so Although I throw a whole bunch of examples out, you know, the point you hit is there's some very formal academic registers uh, where we work that may or may not bring to us a lot of insight about, say, the learner who wrote that particular language, which is not to say we don't have some language from those learners that you know, might give us that insight. You guys are seeing NLP all the time. Every time you type at your screen, your grammar checkers, your word checkers, your spell checkers, uh, every time you pick up email, uh, if any of you are Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant users, you're familiar with these tools. Um, we've talked about this past decade as being the, the decade of NLP. Huge amounts of research are taking place. Uh, folks both in computer science as well as on the linguistic side are extremely active and many of these tools have really uh, come to fore or really gotten good at what they do in the past 10 to 12 to 15 years. One of the biggest problems in NLP is staying up with the research. Uh, there's active discussions about how do you follow the 100, 150 new articles a day on archive to, to stay up with this sort of, uh, sort of work. Um, the social media that you write and that all of us on the planet are writing are being processed and analyzed every second of every day. Um, the reviews you write for foods or movies, the contact forms you fill out with vendors, the support tickets that get opened when you call a help desk, all of these are your words or the words of fellow human beings that are being recorded and, and used and thought about with that same premise. If I give some words uh, to say AT&T, I call up their call center and have an interaction with them, uh, it's one of the most valuable things AT&T has. Uh, about me as a customer. It knows what I care about. I have an AT&T phone on my, on my belt. It's throwing out about a thousand data points an hour. So AT&T is not short of data about me. But the minute I call the call center and they get a hundred of my words, they know what kind of customer I am. Am I a satisfied customer? Am I an angry customer? Am I calling because of my bill or because of the hardware that I have that isn't working? Um, have I called before with another sort of problem? And in fact, the AT&T modelers who every day are thinking about you as a customer, Verizon is doing this as well, um, actually want some words from you. They love that you comment on their products in social media or that you call their 1-800 number and say some words to them and interact with someone at their call center. By the way, unless you're dealing with a really small business uh, that's dealing with really antiquated technology, every time you call one of those lines, every word you say is being recorded, it's being transcribed, it's being collated, it's being analyzed. They're looking for larger patterns across hundreds of thousands or millions of calls, and they're using that to guess what, better work with you, better sell you further products and services. Uh, every time you tweet something, 
Um, models of you that are out there statistically are being changed. In fact, many of the models out there for customer service and customer satisfaction look for individuals who posted at least two critical social media posts. Something critical or negative garners the attention of the social media monitors out there. If you want to try this, let's say you're an AT&T customer and you think you're paying a little bit too much every month on your AT&T bill, go out and type on Twitter just a, two uh, maybe not broadly positive, maybe not broadly negative tweets and then watch what happens. Within several weeks, you're going to have different sorts of communications from AT&T. You might get some offers you've never had before. Uh, you might get someone who calls you and says, let's work together to try and lower your bill. Um, they are monitoring. They're also monitoring what people are saying about Verizon. Why are they doing that? Because those Verizon customers, they would love that they churn and become AT&T customers. Um, so the words you say in any setting, on the phone, in social media, are being used, are being looked at, are being analyzed uh, in various ways. And by the same token, we can do the same thing as learning analytics researchers. There are two tools we're gonna to share some knowledge about today that are in widespread use. How do I deal with language data? Um, how do I take this mass of student reflections or service learning journals or writings that students have given me in the course of my online course and do something with them, get, uh, get some organization, get some insight? Uh, the first tool that we're gonna to mention today is LUC, L-I-W-C. Um, that is one of the most widely used and cited in the research literature. I think there's some Luke users in the room, if I'm not mistaken. I, I know Peggy and others have written using Luke. Um, this piece of software actually has its base at UT Austin. It comes out of the psycholinguistics tradition out of uh, Jamie Pennebaker's lab. It is unfortunately no longer freely accessible. It's not a terribly expensive piece of software. You can buy it online. There used to be a free version of it that you could go to online and put sample texts into it. Uh, we believe that's behind a, a paywall now, unfortunately. Um, but it's certainly, if you're going to work with natural language processing or natural language as part of your research, something that we, we highly recommend. The WC stands for word count. Um, it's a very lexically based uh, program, but it allows you to take chunks of text, that entry that a student wrote in a service learning journal, uh, plug it in and get some um, categorizations and counts and calculations about what is contained in that text. Is it a primarily social text, right? How many social words happen? I, this is just an example of many, many different categories that come off of a Luke analysis. Is its emotive state primarily positive or primarily negative? Does it seem to be more academic? Do you seem to see more cognitive sort of processes happening? Um, how authentic is it as a piece of writing? How narrative is it as a piece of writing? Once again, you may be looking for certain patterns, certain ideas, uh, certain ways of thinking or ways that students might be growing using a tool like this. And this is certainly one that allows you to take that messy, unstructured text input move it through the system and get some output from which you might be able to glean some insight as a researcher. Uh, probably the best known article um, was actually led by Professor Pennebaker in 2014. He took all of the, the college admissions essays uh, for UT Austin in a given year, right? You apply to UT Austin, you have to write an essay still. This is one of those schools where you still write the essay. And because he works at UT Austin, actually he doesn't identify Austin in the article, uh, I, I don't think I've given away any great secret, um, he began to look at the language that was used by successful applicants to Austin versus the language that was used by those who were less successful, did not gain entrance to Austin, and really found that this academic sort of language that Neela was talking about, when they saw that in the essays, we tend to privilege that sort of information, especially in college admission sorts of processes. That was a quick and easy way for them to categorize this huge mass of data. Interestingly enough, and there are several talks by Dr. Pennebaker out and available on YouTube if you have not seen him speak. Um, one of his points is that we all concentrate on quote unquote the content words, right? Uh, the nouns and verbs that tend to make the, the, the key portions of text or bring 
uh, larger chunks of meanings to text. Frequently, it's how you use your prepositions or how you use your articles uh, that mark the type of text or writing or language expression that you're making. And so he has a whole series of talks and articles about don't pay attention to the big words, the big content words, pay attention to the little words. Frequently, that gives you information about style or text type uh, or focus of a particular task. And sometimes the, uh, uh, the insights in the pronouns rather than the nouns. And this article is up in our, our bibliography for you as well. Um, and uh, hopefully Elizabeth will have a, a chance at the end to talk a bit about uh, the curated uh, resources. The second piece of software we would love to share with you is Cometrics. Uh, this comes out of the University of Memphis uh, and our Gracers lab, which says, you know what? Uh, word count is wonderful. Looking at the individual words in a given uh, text is a wonderful approach. Uh, but we also want to think about texts as larger pieces of discourse. And they have features as larger texts as well. So some, for example, are more factual. Some are more narrative. Um, we can think about texts at the text level rather than the word level as having different features that may be interesting for us to examine. Um, and once again, uh, also like uh, Luke, it's becoming unfortunately a little less accessible. There is a web interface where you could go and put text data into Cometrics, but it's fairly limited in the amount of text that it will allow you to do for free. Uh, obviously for, for uh, financial stability and so on, they're really uh, attempting to find paying customers and, and researchers who can support their work uh, as they move forward. If you have not heard the name Mia McDowell, uh, you will. Uh, many of you who've been here at Link for a number of years have uh, had the good opportunity to meet Professor McDowell now in the UC system. Um, she has a whole series of key articles about where you might use the output of a Cometrics analysis. Um, and she, for example, is looking at student mentors or student leaders and thinking about what types of texts at the larger level um, do we tend to see in successful mentors or leaders and a whole variety of cognitive and affective and social insights that you can get out of that text. So the challenge is still the same. I've got some words. They're written by students, they're written by parents, they're transcripted in a classroom or maybe a transcript of a tutoring session. How do I pull some information out of those words in a way that lets me as a researcher go forward and think about what's in that, in that text? Humans do this really well. Right? We look at a text and say, yes, that's factual. This other text is more narrative. Uh, this text is, uh, uh, has certain features here that make it very positive in tone. This text over here has features that make it very negative in tone. Uh, we do these things almost instantaneously uh, when we read or grade papers or, or grade student projects. Uh, much, much harder for a computer to do. And now everybody's in the market trying to do this. Um, AWS has a product where you can send it large amounts of language and it will help you categorize it, analyze it, think about its affect, um, a wide variety of things that are out there. Google, which we're going to show you in a second here, is another tool that has a wide uh, suite Google Cloud of natural language tools. You may have heard of OpenAI, Allen AI. The, the AI world is really abuzz with tasks and debates that at their heart are about language. Yes, they're, they're, they're you know, big compute and, and crunching, you know, petabyte after petabyte of numbers, but oftentimes when we think about what does artificial intelligence look like or what would we like artificial intelligence to look like, um, frequently language is at the center of that. You know, can a computer quote unquote comprehend or understand a text in the way that humans can do in an instant? And these are some of the, the debates that you're going to, uh, to hear about. We're actually going to show you some examples of output as well from the Google Cloud tool. That's one that we find particularly interesting. Uh, but if you're a researcher with language data, it's yet another place you might think about as a, a set of tools to look at some of the, some of the data. Um, in fact, when AWS rolled their tool out for language, it was a, one of the highlights of the year. And and, and in fact, this is how many commercial entities are doing their NLP. Are they hiring teams of linguists and teams of ethnographers to carefully study and do 
NLP style research, unfortunately, uh, for the linguists, not, uh, not so much. Oftentimes they'll go out and find a large corporate entity like AWS. You've all heard of Watson as well. A lot of the success of IBM's Watson um, in those areas where Watson has had some successes have been with language and its language services and its ability to deal with language elements as opposed to numerical elements. I'm going to jump ahead here and, and get to this notion of NLU, natural language understanding. The question I just asked was, how is a computer going to become more like a human? Um, it's one thing to count words, to be able to look at text and see whether it has a basically positive valence or a basically negative valence. Um, those things that I might associate in general with the world of NLP. What we're moving towards is really these much more complex human-like tasks that we would love uh, computers to help us with. Things like um, fake news detection. Everybody been reading about fake news recently? Um, there are a wide variety of researchers out there who are working on systems and platforms and, and algorithms that you feed it a text and it tells you whether it meets certain criteria for fake news. But that's not something you can do by counting the number of words in the text or counting the number of positively oriented words in the text. It requires not only some uh, material that be pulled out of the text, but also some external models, right? Is the fact that's cited in this text typically agreed to by others? Is it seen as a fact in Wikipedia, or is it something that's been manipulated in this quote unquote fake news text? Uh, lots of work going on on hate speech detection. Right, and one of the key areas that this is happening is in the social media uh, sphere. Uh, Facebook is not only conducting, but uh, also funding uh, large amounts of research to think about texts in much more complex, much more human-like ways to say, yeah, that one is filled with some problematic language. Maybe my algorithm is not going to allow it to be posted versus this other one, uh, which doesn't seem to be so filled with uh, negative or attacking language. Um, there's a lot of work about bullying and cyberbullying, uh, with the notion being here too, that as you start moving into social media platform sizes, there's just too many words. Right? Humans cannot look at all of these texts. Um, if you complain to Facebook and say, I've had a negative experience with someone else's post, there's a good chance that the first pass through that post will be automated. Uh, they will look and see whether their algorithms might declare it an example of bullying or hate speech. And only in a second or third pass might a human look at it and, and make a dis distinction accordingly. And this is where we think natural language processing, I'm going to be sort of uh, general here, grows up, right? Starts to ask really interesting questions and starts to do really interesting tasks. Can we look at text and tell how engaged a student is? That's an interesting question. We're, we're really, and have been thinking about this as educators for years. We know, we have in our mind this ideal of an engaged student. Um, we know it when we see it in many cases in our classroom or when a student comes to visit us in our office hours, but how might we know it through their writing and work if, say, they're in an online course with us or we have a huge, large section with hundreds of students and we're really trying to get some sense for how engaged an individual student might be. These are tough questions. Um, and the classroom as well is also a place that a lot of natural language understanding is going on. Algorithms, for example, that listen to classroom discourse, listen to what teachers say, listen to how students respond, and look for patterns. One of the most egregious set of patterns that we frequently find is questioning or interaction with females that is different than your questioning or interaction with males. And how do we make sure that we are being completely unbiased uh, and, and as morally correct as we can be um, to not say ask technical questions to the males and less technical questions to the females? And how might you do that? And, and this is just a short list on a variety of these really complex, interesting topics. So to my mind and to our mind, it's that you, where we move from just counting words or counting connections in sentences and we move to the really complex um, natural language understanding sorts of tasks. It's tough. Um, 
We think it's realistic. When you ask somebody what's the difference between NLP and NLU, uh, they'll frequently be, be hard pressed to define that difference. Um, typically, it's seen as something more human like than NLP, right? We can look at that paragraph and say, yeah, that's bullying. There's something going on where one individual is expressing language and using it to attack another, or that's hate speech. Um, but once again, training the models to do those complex tasks uh, is much more complex. We're really thinking about the word knowledge. And we're trying, I think, and the AI debates, which I'll share just a couple references to in a second, are really based around this notion of, can we work in a very empirical way, throw trillions and trillions of words, build lots of models, um, and really think about language just based on the data? Or do we have to, in some way, bring in organized knowledge about a setting or a situation or, say, the way one defines hate speech or bullying? And how do we combine these two schools of thought? Um, so part of what we think is happening in NLU is we're going to need to think about more organized forms of knowledge and how those are going to be brought into the models we build into the future. It may not be an example of we need more data, we need more data, we need more data, which is what you hear in a lot of AI settings, but maybe we need more frameworks and more ontologies and more ways to allow these algorithms to think uh, symbolically in addition to empirically. Um, this is a, it's, what you do instantaneously as a human is really quite remarkable. The ability to listen, to bring perception to a task, to look at a, a visual field, to pick up a text, to draw certain information and certain inferences from a text, to bring all your historical and cultural knowledge to bear in your comprehension of that text. That's a really phenomenal act when you think about it. Um, but it's also an act that's not in any way fully understood uh, by the neurolinguists or the cognitive scientists. There's still basic things we don't understand about what's happening uh, in cognition during a lot of these. Um, but for example, your ability to pick up a text, read it, and summarize it. Right? Text is two pages long, but you need to summarize it in two or three sentences. Um, most adult humans do that quite well. Um, it's one of the hardest tasks for a machine to do. Because as I said, you bring a whole variety of uh, elements of perception and elements of processing and knowledge and experience together um, to do that. Question answering is another test that we frequently give to these artificial systems to determine whether, quote unquote, it's comprehending or knowing or showing understanding. And so what was one of the first things that Watson did uh, when it burst onto the stage, was it 2011, I think it was, goes on Jeopardy and shows that it can answer questions or answer in the form of a question uh, just as well as humans can. Um, Watson was actually a primarily uh, symbolic based system. It was pretty early on in the natural processing of uh, the past decade. And about 80% of Jeopardy questions are answerable by the titles alone in Wikipedia entries. So in fact, it was using a knowledge base that was working off of a very early version of Wikipedia. And one of the things that the Jeopardy, uh, uh, the, the, the workers at, at Watson figured out was, you don't even have to read all X trillion words. All you need are the headings and subheadings and able to answer most Jeopardy questions. Uh, I don't know whether that's still true today, uh, but that was an example of them writing some algorithms, coming to a, essentially a language task, and a language task that required some knowledge, right? Some, some trivia knowledge and, and knowledge of the world but also frequently has plays on words and, and a wide variety of other language things that we as humans do really well um, and, and machines typically don't. Uh, if you have been following the AI debates, and if you haven't, I urge you to do that. Uh, this is one of the Bengio brothers, right? Yashua is out there. Um, a huge debate erupted in late 2019, still going on today, of some very successful award-winning AI researchers, primarily in the Toronto School around Jeff Hilton, and some researchers in the United States, uh, primarily around a researcher named Gary Marcus, um, and this is Gary here, um, that got so ugly insulting each other on Twitter, they weren't insulting each other's mothers, but they were about oh, to that man. stage. Um, what does it mean to be intelligent? How will we know when artificial general intelligence is a thing and we've reached that level? Um, 
Are the computer science researchers going in the right directions, building bigger and faster computers, for lack of a better sense, bigger and faster models, collecting more and more data? Or do we need to invite more linguists like Henry into the process uh, in order to think in deeper ways about language and how language conveys meaning and what meaning you want to extract from a text? They even did a live, this is a part of a live internet debate where they sort of went at each other. Um, Twitter was just all aghast at how they were attacking each other. Um, and in fact, the name Gary Marcus is one that um, I, I would recommend to you and you have several items in the curated bibliography uh, from Professor Marcus. Uh, he has spent time at New York University. He's also been in and out of the AI startup world. He's currently stepped away from universities and he's part of a robotics uh, startup. But he is really jabbing at the AI researchers saying, hey, this stuff you guys are doing, it, 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 it's going to be a dead end. You're really not making any progress in what we might call deeper understanding or deeper comprehension or computers behaving more like humans would in the face of input such as language. Um, one of the typical tests that we use is, you know, can a computer uh, be given or a system that you know, claims to have natural language processing or natural language uh, understanding abilities be given a text and a set of questions and answer questions about that text? And then, of course, the cognitive scientists will say, well, is that really comprehension? All that computer is doing, that system is doing, is scanning sentences, looking for words that seem to be close to the words that are in the sentence. You know, so if you give this uh, 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 computer or this system a, a text about uh, the weather, and then you give it a question, the color of the sky is blank and you ask it to fill in the next word, and they gave this to some of the large language models and other AI sorts of uh, research groups that were out there and got all sorts of answers, right? GPT-2, uh, GPT-1, uh, one of the systems answered a deep crimson. I guess maybe during sunset, the sky is a deep crimson. Um, the color of the sky is a sign that the sun has risen or set. Perhaps not a completely inaccurate sentence, but if you gave this question to any five-year-old and said, what color is the sky? The answer that you're probably going to get is blue. Um, and so there are really raucous debates around what does comprehension mean? Uh, the, the, the neuro and cognitive scientists have come uh, into this. Uh, this is a faculty member from Tufts and Harvard who says, you know what? We don't even really fully understand what comprehension is yet at a certain level. So we really need to think about what we're doing and how we're doing it before we ask computers to, um, to emulate it. And, you know, just understanding itself is a tough concept. Uh, part of it's linguistic, uh, part of it's cognitive, uh, part of it's knowledge about the world, uh, part of it is basic common sense knowledge. If I have a cup of liquid and I turn that liquid or turn that cup over, what happens to the liquid, right? Everybody in the room knows the answer to that question. Uh, but if there is some understanding or processing of a text where a cup is spilled and it doesn't actually overtly say all of the liquid in the cup ran out, um, most of the linguistics and knowledge-based approaches that we have today uh, would struggle to answer what happened to the liquid in the cup, uh, although that's basic uh, world knowledge that we as humans um, have. Interestingly, something like 65% of all AI startups, by the way, are language-based. Uh, so when you start to see um, what's happening in the AI world where people clearly are thinking about what this range of technologies and this way of thinking about the world, how it's going to grow and change in the next couple of decades, um, NLP is, is at the center of it, right? Uh, Amazon at the heart of it. Um, anybody actually spoken to a person at Amazon ever? Yes. Um, and once, <laughs> um, uh, nowadays, of course, uh, if anything happens, you have any interaction with Amazon, uh, the the vast majority of your words in that first pass are all read by algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, if your package is late and you want to get on and, and complain or find out, you know, might you get a refund of some sort, what do you get, a text box or a chat? Mm -hmm. It's essentially a chat bot serving as a front for a bank of humans, uh, but you almost never interact with a human. And guess what those chat bots and algorithms are looking for? 
key words about you as a customer. You can say, my package is late, it was supposed to arrive by nine. Or you can say, I'm really disappointed in Amazon and going to purchase my goods somewhere else. I'm a very disappointed customer. And you may get a very different reaction uh, when you type words in that give Amazon the impression that clear impression uh, that you are an upset or frustrated customer and you may take your business elsewhere. No human will ever see those words. They have a set of algorithms and models that are modeling customer responses and customer input and, and AI is determining the, uh, the future of those um, those interactions with you. So every time you give some words to AT&T or Amazon or Facebook, uh, think about the fact that they're all being examined, they're all being processed, uh, your words are being valued as an insight to who you are and how you're thinking about a particular task. And lastly, before we uh, take just a minute or two break and go to our hands-on, we have a QEP here on campus about teamwork. We have been thinking over the past several months about how we could bring NLP or more particularly NLU to this task. But teamwork is one of those big, complex, difficult to define, hard to operationalize topics um, that involve a whole bunch of uh, key uh, steps, right? You work together in a team to set mutual goals and plans. You share responsibilities. You work together in ways that are respectful. You encourage trust among others. Well, you could look at a post or a discussion or a chat and say, those two students are really working well together. They seem to be supporting each other and trusting each other. You as a human could see that in a heartbeat. Um, very, very hard for a computer to score. Um, and so we're thinking about some of these harder, big, complex topics um, that we may be able to detect Thousands of students at UTA every semester going forward are going to be writing hundreds of thousands of millions of words about teamwork. No human can read it all. It's, you're, it's, it's oftentimes difficult for you, even in your own course, uh, to read everything that students write, every single word. One of the things that we're thinking about is algorithms and other ideas that attack that big concept of teamwork or things such as trust or uh, working together in shared ways. So more on that in July when we talk. Uh, we're actually using some of these new approaches and new ideas uh, to think about new ways that give us more insight into text uh, rather than uh, not. I am way over time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take a breath and take a drink of the liquid I haven't yet spilled. Um, maybe we should take about a two minute break or so and then we're going to let you touch some language data. We do have uh, cookies and drinks and Why everybody coffee get drink? in the back if you want to get some. And in a moment, if you would make sure please that you have this handout. Um, we're gonna we're gonna spend some time uh, thinking about language data itself here. Okay. Here's a couple more slides. We can we can back to Shall we uh, look at some student language, some learner language? I think everybody has a handout. I'm gonna be quiet for about 90 seconds. What I'd like to ask you to do is read through five samples of language, five uh, segments of language that were provided by the learners um, of essentially secondary school age after a short course on leadership. The content area was leadership. And then they were asked to answer the question, how have you shown leadership or become a leader? I'm gonna be quiet. I'd like you to read each of the five and I'm gonna ask you some questions about these five. We're gonna make some judgments about these five and, and think about how they might be analyzed, how we might uh, learn from these samples of text.
All right, I'm going to ask you to put on your uh, teacher's hat and pretend that you have a red pen in your hand. Which of these five contains the most content or information about leadership? And why? There's no right or wrong answer here. Could you repeat that question? So which of the five contains the most content? Frequently as uh, we divide our domains via content uh, breakup, um, if I were a teacher of leadership looking for concepts in leadership, ideas about leadership, content they may have studied in their course, um, it's a little hard, we're out of context here, but which of them strikes you as having the most content information about leadership? Somebody bring you, I'm gonna, I'll the pick on Kim. One, five. The last one, five. Why'd you pick the last one, Kim? Because I am learning about three different styles of leadership and a definition in the student's word of each one. Man, this is like somebody who's read the theoretical paragraphs in the textbook and <laughs> actually is able to, to give them back in a, in a little interview or in a piece of text. Boy, we always, our eyes sort of gravitate to that. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to argue for another one? Please. Second one. Yeah, tell me why you picked that. Relate to what is being taught and uh, reflects on how, uh, what he's learned from the talk, his personal experience. Personal experience. Shows that he was engaged in the talk. So, not only theory, but application, right? Frequently, also something that we look for as educators. We can take the theoretical framework and tie it to our experience. Anybody drawn to another one, please? Yeah, I also agree with that. Uh, I the second one. Number two. Okay. Because the theme overall is like it is collaborative approach. That how I feel like it should be. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. I think the fourth one has char many character in, in a list format has many characteristics of being a good leader. Very nice. So there's definitely, yeah, yeah, following up also on both of the ideas in back, oh. some of the good social or affective mm -hmm. uh, qualities or values related to good leadership. Yes, you want to add? Uh, I don't know if it's relevant, but I might like to identify my personal bias, so maybe I'm drawn to the second answer because of my personal bias. And that may be, yes, we as human readers and human graders all come uh, with unique histories, unique ideas, you know, approaches to teaching a topic like leadership, very much so. So we ran these, um, I'm going to ask you some more questions, but I'm going to give away what's on the back now. Uh, we ran these pieces of text through Luke and Cometrics. Uh, I thought you guys had some really interesting insights. If you flip the page over, um, let's look at Luke first. Um, as we looked upon, especially, and this is an interesting group, very seldom do I get folks who look at text too, I love it. Um, if you look at the social words and the scoring of text number two in Luke up here, you see that far and away, um, it is, along with number three, I think, which was that the one, Peggy, you were looking at, um, really begins to think about the social nature and social values around leadership. So Luke would have given us some information as to what text number two may bring. Um, there was also an entry that's given to us by Luke on cognitive processes. Where do we tend to see something that might be analytic? And in fact, if you look down in the summary variables under analytic, the one that um, Luke scores as the most analytical is number four. And, but, and I've seen that with Luke before, what it chooses to be analytical is sometimes because of the fewer words, but I, I think there's something in that analytical variable of Luke that sometimes gets caught up. So in fact, if you looked at certainly just the style on the page, oftentimes your eye is drawn to number five because it's just the longest one, right? Seems to have really high style. There's a theoretical organization and framework to it. There's lots of use of good vocabulary in there, right? Democratic leadership, uh, autocratic sorts of words, right? Uh, number four looks a little more informal with all those dot, dot, dots. 
in it, right? Your eye doesn't necessarily immediately tag that one as being of the highest register and perhaps thus not of the highest analytical value. Um, so what does that tell us? Does that tell us that Luke uh, gives us some insight into a variety of elements of text? Yeah. Um, does it always necessarily correlate with uh, human reads or human readers looking at similar texts. Uh, no, nor does any really algorithm or system uh, that tends to be brought together with both humans and uh, the, the computational approaches. Look at, go back to the front page now. If I asked you which sample is the best organized or logical, Frequently, we look for organized, coherent, logical thought. Sometimes we call that critical thinking, whatever critical thinking is. Um, which of the five texts would you argue is the most organized and coherent? No peeking on the back, because you can guess where we're going next. <laughs> Peggy. Oh, I thought number three. Uh, it kind of told a narrative. Number three is, yeah. is by far and away the most narrative, yeah. right? Yeah. Mr. T had a talk with me after our first class. Here's a quote, Try, here's what the, the teacher told, or the coach told this learner, try and use something to your advantage. Very nice. Who else would like to comment on the organization, logical order of thoughts and concepts in one of the texts? I think four and five are close to each other. Yeah. Four and five are close to each other, why? Um, they're they're putting it in a a way that makes sense. They're 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 putting like thoughts together. They're as you move through the piece, it's building. Things are building through there, and there's some conclusions in there. Exactly like reading essays on the history of 1511 exam, right? And boy, and that's number what my five, eye goes to. Your eye goes to. Boy, it's hard to beat a theoretical framework, right? Number five, an example underneath. Um, that's a level. Do you find that? Number issue? four would be a good freshman stamp, though. <laughs> I mean, there are definitions in number five, right? Mm -hmm. And then after, after definition, there are some examples, and after mm -hmm. the exam, there are conclusions. So, a, a freshman astronomy class. <laughs> a freshman astronomy <laughs> class. That's what we're looking for. So if you flip the page over, Cometrics, which works at a more text level, that looks at things such as depth of uh, uh, narrativity versus not. Uh, they have a, a scale called deep cohesion that in many ways we are associating with organized logical thinking um, and coherence. And you'll notice that far and away, this, the text that Cometrics would say has the most of those features is number three. Look the page back. I guess we did talk about number three. We said, yes, it's narrative, um, but because, yeah, she says very linear, right? There's the word that we were looking for. Um, so Cometrics you know, would certainly point out some of the features of number three. Look how Cometrics scored number five. I guess that would have been about the second one on the scale in general. Uh, Cometrics gives us z-scores. Uh, we're not going to go into a huge amount of uh, thinking or processing about how to look at some of these scores, um, but clearly uh, the ones that, for example, come across as the most narrative are one and three and Cometrics. I think if you flip the, the page back, you would probably agree that of our five, uh, one and three seem to be probably the most narrative, and number two is a close, right close behind them, right? Number two also seems very narrative. So there's a wonderful example of a tool uh, that's doing automated processing at the discourse level that comes very close, I think, to our intuition as a group, as very skilled human readers who've read these sorts of uh, summaries of, of content for some time. And it's like when, when you do the essays like Neil and I would have that we'd want to look for, it's actually a combination of narrativity, but also the deep and referential cohesions. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. You need to have that histogram so you can see how it looks. Now I'm going to ask you a question specific, I think, to all of us as educational researchers, learning analytics researchers. Which paragraph demonstrated the most student learning insight or growth? Growth? I would say number two because a conclusion has been reached at that point where they've understood it's not about bossing around and that it's all about recruiting volunteers is more of what 
leadership ends up being in the final conclusion. And, and my eye goes immediately to number two as well. Sometimes these are really well signposted, right? Well, I've been here, I have learned, right? There's just a verb. Here is what I learned, colon. And, and the person literally speaks that out. Yes, other texts, which shows the most student learning development or growth. Well, number three, they talk about if they didn't understand what the, the teacher had said and then the instructor said it, then after a couple of weeks they understood it. Very nice. And it's not fully signposted, right? Is there actually a verb of learning in there somewhere? Um, actually, in the middle, right down near the bottom, I reflected back on it and actually came to a conclusion. So that would have caught a human reader's eye. Very, yeah, perfect. Um, anybody want to argue for any of the others? You begin to see the more complex the questions, uh, the deeper the analysis, the more that you bring world knowledge, experience, uh, knowledge of reading texts such as this to see student growth um, that we simply cannot um, emulate yet um, in any of the systems that we have shown you. Uh, just for completeness sake, we gave you the output of what Google language uh, would have told you about uh, one of these texts. I think this is text three. Um, it does not work at any of the levels, not at the psycholinguistic level that Luke works at, not at the coherence or discourse level that Cometrics works at. Google natural language is really talking about the entities that are in each of the texts, the sentiment. If I ask you which of these texts is the most positive as a human reader could you give me some information about that my hand goes to four yeah why'd you pick four yeah which you can do intuitively in, in tenths of a second. Very nice. Anybody want to argue for, or I could have asked that question, what is the most negative? And really, I didn't, we didn't pick any negative ones. Um, anybody else want to argue for the positive nature of any other text? I would just say the word advantage, number three. I mean, like those code, like kind of coding words, advantage, um, good leader, good leader. Um, understood those kind of positive and if you look on the sentiment scoring by the google tool uh, advantage is one of those words it looked at i would agree with you i think that carries a very positive valence um a, a, a real promise in this particular text although you'll notice that the uh, the score magnitude and the scoring of advantage was was pretty weak in google uh cloud once again i think we as human readers can really move in ways and make intuitive sorts of readings of these texts this we could do in you know, why would we use a, a, a computer-based system or tool if you only had this many essays to grade um, you as humans would grade them you as humans would look for that insight you look to see whether good organization is present or good content knowledge is present whether they're showing good positive tone uh, whether they're showing learning Kim, have you ever had only five essays to grade in any semester? No, neither is Nyla, I bet. Um, as we get to um, the state that I call too many words too fast, right? If we have a thousand of these to grade, you know, having an algorithm or system that may help us approach these texts that we will collect, be it on leadership or teamwork or the essays that you read in your classes, what we're clearly seeing is each of the tools is bringing us some insight typically in the area uh, for the tradition in which it comes, right? If we're looking for psycholinguistic insight and the sorts of things Luke tells us, yes, we can begin to see pretty quickly that Luke is very skilled at finding social words or negative emotions or analytic sorts of texts. We can find that Cometrics is very good at identifying narrativity versus factual and looking at logical, organized, cohesive. Where we struggle was in questions like that third one. Where's the learning? in these texts. That's a really complex topic. Now, we're giving you these texts out of context. You don't know who the learners were. You don't know what knowledge they started with. You don't know what the curriculum of the course was. I put the citation at the bottom if you're terribly intrigued and want to read the citation. Um, but 
it's these complex questions that add up to the you in natural language understanding that I think you will see some really interesting development on uh, in the next coming years. And you know, that's what we're really waiting for. Uh, one of the approaches that's really come to fore, and we'll just add this technical bit here at the end, and then we'll open it up for general questions. Um, folks who are looking at what the next generation of NLP and NLU look like are working with an area that's known as vector space modeling. Uh, we're taking words, we're taking sentences, and by we, I mean people like Henry. Um, uh, we're taking whole texts, and we are beginning to represent them um, in rich ways numerically numerically that we can do analysis with. Um, so for example, words are turned into uh, wildly enumerated vectors, um, you know, oftentimes of 500 dimensions or 1,000 dimensions. Um, and if your brain starts to fog over at that, we work and think in three, sometimes four dimensions. Uh, the idea of us thinking or even visualizing what an 11 dimensional space might look like or a 1,024 dimensional space might look like is essentially not possible for us as humans, but it's very easy for computers to do to represent words or sentences or ideas or concepts or pixels in an image if you're trying to do image matching. Um, all of these things. Um, uh, really allow us to begin to think about text in very interesting ways numerically. And then you can start to represent concepts, ideas in ways that you can do analysis on them, find clusters of words and concepts, ways of thinking about language that are different. This field has really emerged starting in about 2013 with some of the early what's known as word to vex studies. In essence, it's an intermediate representation of language material. The vector itself isn't a piece of analysis. It's a representation, a rich representation of text that's allowed us to do some interesting things and begin to build models that can detect hate speech. If we give it a whole series of texts that we would classify as having hate speech in them, allowing uh, the, the, the computational vectorization to happen and then comparing the vectors of one text or piece of of text uh, with those that are known hate speech versus those that are known not to be hate speech, we can begin to see that as we talk about distances in thousand dimensional space, how far a text might be. Does it tend to cluster with the hate speech texts or does it tend to cluster away from the hate speech texts? And so as we think about some of these new methods and we're going to share some modeling we are doing, we're basically writing models to think about teamwork concepts. Um, we're going to show it good examples of teamwork and good writing and critical thinking about teamwork, build vector and fine-tune uh, models using vector space techniques, and then let the model help us begin to look at texts and uh, perhaps move through student writing about teamwork uh, in a way that may be more fortuitous for us as educators when we have too many essays to grade, when we have too many words coming in to us to be able to do it. Now, I did hear somebody say over break, wouldn't it be nice to talk about AI plus HI, right? Human intelligence plus AI. There's a lot of work going on in that world as well. How, first of all, how do we bring human expertise in some organized way into computational methods? How do we pair HI, human activity and human intelligence in optimal maze with algorithms and systems? that do what algorithms and systems do well? What is it that humans do particularly well? That's exactly the problem Facebook is finding now, right? If it's answering about a million complaints an hour um, on text on its platform, it's doing some passes algorithmically, making some decision making, and at certain points turning some texts over to humans, some will never get to humans. Um, and that's in essence a large experiment in uh, what does the human do well, what do the algorithms do well, how do they work together? And in many of your cases, as you're thinking about what do bots look like or other intelligent sorts of platforms with which you will work in your lifetime, um, what do those interactions look like and how are, how are they structured and what is the, uh, the power uh, of an algorithm to work with language? And on that, I'm going to hold off and we're going to tell you the second part of this story, hopefully in July or August. Uh, we're going to let you see some of the results of some of our work. Um, 
we are collecting in a variety of ways student writing here at UTA. Many of you are thinking, where do I have student words and student writing in my own curriculum uh, that I may find some interesting insights in? You know, maybe I read it as a human in the grading process, but might want to look for larger scale patterns and there an algorithmic tool uh, might help. We would be delighted to, to talk with folks and think about the ways some of these tools might be applied to the work you're doing already. And then the good news, um, there's all sorts of new resources Research coming out. Um, it's a field that's moving so rapidly forward, it's, it's really frightening. You, we, we go to conferences and talk about how we can't possibly keep up. Um, who's written an algorithm to go and read all the AI papers today around natural language and send me a summary uh, would be a wonderful discussion at many of the conferences I go to because there's simply too many words for us to keep up with all of the, the NLP research. We think that language data and unstructured data brings a great richness. Uh, we believe in that premise that I mentioned at the beginning, that the words that individuals use and produce bring us insight into their cognitive and social and affective beings um, and bring us context and bring us information that we might not find in the quantified form uh, in so many of our systems. Now, I could look in a system and tell you that student one has a GPA of 3.3 and student or student five has a 3.3 you know, and number one has a 3.8. That may give you some context, right? I may know that number one got an A in History 1311 and uh, number five got a B in History 1311. As we start, once again, there's that quantitative qualitative divide. Uh, as we begin to think about ways to bring those data together, we'll also uh, get into some very interesting topics. The new models are particularly exciting. They're fueling a whole new generation uh, of what's happening in the natural language processing. The Google tools and others uh, are getting better and better. Um, I wish I could say that about Siri. I can't. Sorry, Apple. Um, but as these companies have begun to move to some of the more vector-based approaches, as they're thinking and taking part in some of these larger AI debates, um, they're really themselves thinking and providing tools and insights into the role of language. Um, and that's, that, that's where we hope we gave you some information and some ideas and some tools today. Um, other piece, and I don't know if I can get out of this and get back to the canvas, um, course. We'll see if Henry can do that. Uh, we have a wonderful set of curated resources. Elizabeth Powers has joined us online and was uh, the, the third in our organizing team. And uh, the bibliography and tool set that's provided there uh, will let you talk about a wide variety of the topics we mentioned today. So when you go into the Canvas course and register, uh, this is actually the tools version, and this is actually the, uh, the bibliography. So if you would like to read further on unstructured data in education, some of the definitions of NLP and NLU, some of the folks who are thinking about what does NLU look like? What, how will I know when these systems are as smart as I want them to be? What will it look like? Um, and these are interesting questions that all of us who work with linguistic data, um, I, I think really need to be challenged by. These are also articles and materials and some of the themes that we use in our basic course on language data. Uh, it was in MOOC format two years ago as part of the MicroMasters. It will be part of the upcoming uh, Masters in Learning Analytics when it uh, unrolls here at UTA, hopefully uh, shortly, uh, when, when we get the official go ahead for that. Um, so some of the reading that we do, some of the reading on vector spaces and some of the ideas that we'll pick up in part two in August are also here for you to read. We would be delighted to talk about questions you might have today, but also also to engage with you in, in long-term dialogue. Uh, we need to mention, of course, that there are some folks who are joining us from uh, uh, across the globe today. Uh, if we have any of those questions, we'll be sure to bring them to the group here today. Some will interact with this material asynchronously in the coming weeks. Uh, we also welcome the questions of that group as well as they interact and think about some of these ideas together. We see today as the starting of a discussion. Uh, we would love to facilitate your thinking in this area about the language data you have and what insight it might bring you. And as I said, we'll continue this story in the, the second uh, uh, piece that we'll do later in the summer and, and build on some of these topics, as I said, mostly about the you uh, in natural language understanding. So if there are questions, ideas, comments, anything we can help with before we break today into general conversation, we would uh, love, to, love to hear those. 
was a reading in the deep in thought. Justin, would you like to wrap us up? If there are other questions, um, a couple things. Uh, we did pass around the survey. You feel free to do it digitally if you want to use a QR code or on paper. It's always fun. Um, any of the resources from the event, we'll post it on linkresearchcloud.org. We'll also have it in the Canvas shell. Um, I emailed everybody that did um, RSVP using the Qualtrics form. If you did that, I already sent you this link too, so you should have that. You can enroll as much if you want to take part in future events that we have here at UTA. And we'll end the story network probably. So again, all these will be posted here. Give us a few days and we'll give up. And, um, just want to thank Dr. Pete Smith, Henry, and, and Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Powers, who's joining us online. Thank you, Elizabeth. Online too, um, for thank you for your good input on leadership text too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We will answer if you have individual questions and we can help with anything. If any of the tool sets interested you mm -hmm. uh, for research questions or ideas that you might be thinking of, we'd love to work with you one-on-one, -on -one. please. Can I ask you a question about spelling and grammar? So even when students use word processing programs that have grammar and spelling checks, they ignore the <laughs> suggestions <laughs> <The> information. <laughs> about it and, and does that, how does that impact? This is a huge issue. So many of our models and many of our approaches deal with very standardized language, um, correct spelling. Uh, one of the things, you know, when we do a lot of the NLP research, one of the first set of steps we teach students is essentially data cleaning. Mm -hmm. How do you tokenize, how do you clean language data so that it can make use of it. Spelling is an issue. Do you correct that spelling or do you not? Uh, there are folks who are out there training language models in different styles of language, high style and low style. Uh, there are people out there being, models out there being trained in things such as misspellings or others. But for the most part, we think about standardized correct English. You know, one of the biggest models out there is BERT, you know, trained under the Google researchers. Uh, trillions and trillions of words scraped from the web. So naturally there will be occurring um, misspellings and grammar issues and so on. Um, but for the most part, the models are trained more on standardized language than not. So this is a huge issue. Will it recognize um, a word when it's misspelled? Um, from a student that we would instantly know what that student he or she is writing about, but the model may struggle. Um, and that's a, that's a huge issue. What do you do with that misspelling? Do you correct it so it can be appropriately processed or do you leave it um, in its original form? I don't have an answer for that. A big part of the reasoning on how to answer that question Pete just posed is really gonna be based on what the tool you're using is. Tools like Luke and Cometrics, like he mentioned, really do expect and are built around this notion of, kind of standard English to intentionally use the scare quotes on that. But if you're taking some of these models, like you mentioned BERT, or if you've trained your own model on a large set of representative texts, you may not have to worry about those misspellings or those kind of non-standard elements. Something that I as a linguist would ask is, does this misspelling or does this perhaps unusual word order, does that encode some meaning that I need to be aware of? You're gonna kind of miss out on that if that's not in any of the reference texts that we used to train the model you're working with. But if that does show up in the corpus that was used to build your models, yeah, you could probably leave it in there. It might have valuable, useful information that can be extracted and processed. So we've worked recently with a data set of customer language. Yep. Um, oh, and very non-standard. Very non-standard. These are things people say to customer service, typically when they're unhappy. Often on Twitter. Often on Twitter. <laughs> um, what do you do with emojis? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, someone's written you an email and, and put some sort of smiley face with a tear coming out of one eye but not the other <laughs> eye, right? What do you do with that? Does it convey emotive information? You bet it does. Oh, yeah. And now there are dictionaries and models that are beginning to help us interpret those in an algorithmic sense. What do you do with bad words? Uh, boy, customer service language. I, I'm glad I don't ever work as a customer service rep in detail. Um, support, Ooh, I heff and hate you. Um, what do you do with a, with a sentence like that? Um, Google will let you process it. 
Yeah. Uh, and it will tell you that that word that begins with F has a high negative valence. Um, <laughs> but, you know, those are the sorts of things where humans bring a much more subtle <laughs> approach to some of these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we were working with algorithms, and in fact, we were trying to help with this in multiple languages. Uh, one of the areas where a lot of language work has happened is machine translation. So this wasn't necessarily customers speaking only in English. Uh, we were actually working across eight different languages. Right? Do you know how to be mad or swear um, or to be conciliatory to a customer service agent in a, in a second language? That's a tough thing. Um, and as more and more of these international corporations now have hundreds of millions, if not billions of customers across multiple language sets, everything we've said today with examples in English and a lot of you know, really straightforward, mostly standard English sorts of settings are happening every day across the languages and cultures of the planet. Uh, we'll probably say a little bit more about that in our, in our August uh, talk as well. So the, all of the complexity of world language and culture can come into play. Um, and customer language, boy, uh, when you're a mad customer, you're a mad customer. Yeah. How, how do you how do you prep that language for analysis? Think about the language data that you have. Uh, nearly all of you do have uh, in your various settings. The, the slides that were taken from the introductory MOOC and what will later be the introductory course in, in learning analytics, be it survey or student writing, be it discussion board, um, uh, the Watson tool um, that many folks are familiar with is widely used in industry to look at employees' emails. So as you work in industry and industrial settings, frequently your company will take all of the email that you have sent in the past year and run it through Watson, and Watson will spit out a scorecard for you. Um, do you build trust among the people you write with? Do you show high levels of politeness versus not? Uh, are you able to work in the same way with people across gender or across ethnicity? Um, what sorts of vocabulary do you use and not use? Are you a team player? Um, whether you believe the models that Watson uses or not, uh, many in industry are using tools like that to look at email um, in the corporate setting. Um, any piece of content you have, policy documents, um, laws and how they've developed over time, any of that is language-based data and, and is ripe for algorithmic processing or perhaps even part human, uh, part algorithmic in the, in the future. Good question. And first off, great talk. It was very fascinating to me. I'm new in kind of the field of uh, natural language processing. You talked about how it might be used to identify fake news. Um, yeah. And that to me kind of stumped me because news, right, is something that is breaking, something that is happening in the world. How do you use that to, uh, I guess, suggest something that is fake and it's just now happening? How does it verify these facts, these objective truths? You know? Yeah, there are a couple of approaches. Some are going at it from the, yeah, ontological knowledge perspective. Uh, I said that politician X spent $100 million to do Y. Um, that you can probably verify if you agree on some set place for knowledge, knowledge capture. Let's use Wikipedia for lack of a better term. And I find, yes, the politician X did spend some money doing Y, but it was only $10 million. It wasn't $100 million. Um, so there are certainly knowledge-based approaches. Um, frequently, we think about fake news as being either itself algorithmically generated or perhaps generated in some cases by non-native speakers of English. Um, I myself am a Russianist. I wouldn't begin to speculate who might be doing that on the planet. Um, but we also have pretty good tools that, for example, look at the fluency of a passage um, and can fairly easily detect if it might have been NLG, natural language generation, and done algorithmically or perhaps done uh, by speakers of other languages uh, that I believe one way or the other that those approaches may have some value. There are a couple of other research approaches we're using uh, that combine both data, empirical sorts of approaches, plus knowledge or symbolic base. That's a tough area. Um, but, you know, so is bullying, um, right? Facebook comes under a lot, and, and all of the social media platforms come under a lot of criticism for, we look at this and think, oh my God, how did that get in print? And they'll write back and say, I'm sorry, our algorithms don't really you know, determine that that is negative enough to meet our standard for bullying. Um, they're coming under a lot of pressure uh, because, 
Now, when you get that message, what's the first thing you do? You place that back up on your social media feed and say, hey, humans, anybody think this isn't bullying? Um, and you can start a conversation and draw some attention based on your human read of that text, you know, that an algorithmic read of that text may not bring. Uh, by the same token, if you cannot monitor all of the communications in a given platform, say you're leading a MOOC that has 10,000 participants in it, um, you may value those tools, right? This is the too many words too fast um, case scenario that might alert you to language that looks to be overtly negative. Maybe you're not making a hate speech versus non-hate speech. Maybe it's just a student who's being overly critical or not supportive of another student in a discussion board. And you might value that that be pointed out to you so that you as a human can go look and say, yeah, that crosses my line for appropriate behavior in this course or it doesn't. Um, so yeah, those, those are some big issues. Um, we, would all, we wouldn't necessarily agree on the same definition of hate, of hate speech to begin with, right? Or fake news. Um, yeah, interesting question. Lots of research out there. All right, we'll be glad to answer questions individually. Thank you all for coming. Wonderful yeah. discussions and ideas. Thank you very much. I think it could be on the way out. Take it, cookie with you.